everyone, Andy here, and I'm here with uh, Sneha Patel from Carl Zeiss. Uh, excited to have Sneha here today because we're talking about cinema lenses. That's right. And the, the Zeiss lenses, there you go. <laughs> uh, so, you know, the, some of the questions we get often around here are what makes a lens a cinema lens, right? Yes. There's a variety of lenses in the world, a huge variety of lenses, and, and many of them are made for just traditional still work, right? Still, right. still photo lenses. What makes a still photo lens different than a cinema lens, right? That's the question. Obviously, you put both of them on a camera, you get a picture. Yes. Um, <laughs> but there's something to a cinema lens that makes it different. So I figure who better to ask than Carl Zeiss, who's Zeiss about who's been making lenses for uh, over 100 years, making cinema lenses, lenses for cinema for over 100 years. That's true. About what makes something, like these, these cinema lenses different than the still lenses that we all uh, know about. So. What do you think? What's the big difference? Well, let's talk about what's the similarities first, right? Sure. Yeah. Right? Because, yeah. you know, then it's easier to tell what, what's different. Yeah. Similarities is optically, uh, the glass inside mm -hmm. would be almost the same. Yeah. It's between the optical photography. optical elements yeah. lined up to get a picture, right? In yeah. fact, you can see right here, this is a cutout of a CP2 lens, sure. you know, our compact prime line. And you mm -hmm. can see all the different elements inside. Mm -hmm. Now, this lens at this length wouldn't be much different internally. This, these elements would line up similarly in the, in, still, lens, yeah. in the still lens, sure, right? Yeah. But it's the housing that goes around it mm -hmm. that changes everything. Mechanics, so yes. all of it. Yeah, and you could tell by looking at this uh, cutout of just the housing part mm -hmm. of a CP2 lens. Mm -hmm. This is the 100. And you can see inside that it's all metal. Mm -hmm. So, and from the cutout as well, you can see that everything is held in place by metal. Mm -hmm. so, so very that, durable. Yeah, yeah, very durable. It lasts for a long time. This is basically like a watch, yeah. you know, and the type of precision that it has. You can tell that the difference uh, for sure is that in a focus ring on a CP2 or cinema lens is going to be have a lot longer throw oh, yeah. that you're going to then you're going to have it the more. The still accurate. lens is usually very short, right? Mm -hmm. So you can move for the full range in like a like half turn, you know, not even right. that, yeah. But here it's much further. Why do we have it like that? Well, it's because you want to be able to focus on set and mm -hmm. you want to, you know, people are moving around when mm -hmm. you're shooting a picture. Sure, yeah. And or objects or, you know, things are moving Mo around. Motion pictures, front, yeah. And yeah. motion pictures. Yeah. So you want to be able to hold focus and the more marks you have, the more precise you can be. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know that the sweet spot generally is between four and 14 feet mm -hmm. for most film work. That's because the close up, the medium shot, these mm -hmm. are the most important meaty parts mm -hmm. about a film and there's a lot of movement in mm -hmm. that frame. Mm -hmm. Even if you move a couple of inches, being able to keep that person's face and focus is very important. So, so having that long throw helps mm -hmm. you more easily and, or more, and more accurately track that. And it's fluid and yeah. has a standard gearing on it so mm -hmm. that you can use it with a standard follow focus. Sure, yeah, makes or sense. A or electron or a mechanical follow focus sure. uh, like uh, FF4, FF5. Sure. Or even a electronic follow focus wire system, wireless system from yeah. Preston yeah. or Airy or C Motion yeah. or Crozeal or anybody else, and it's gearing standardized. Required, required gearing, required standardized gearing, standardized gearing, right, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can see that on the iris, there's a T-stop mark. Ah, yeah. So, so this is different. Di most of the lenses are F F-stop yes. versus T-stop. And so. F-stops are calculated mathematically, mm -hmm. not taking into account the different coatings that might mm -hmm. be on the lens. So they're just, f-stop is more theoretical, I suppose. f-stop is more theoretical and yeah. not the most accurate. Like and if you want to use a light meter on a film set yeah. and, and you want to be able to change lenses. So that's another thing. Mm -hmm. In the still world, mm -hmm. you change lenses less often. Right, of course, yeah. Than you One do on cinema around with it more. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, you're an architectural photographer and you use wide lenses. You're a portrait photographer and you use mm -hmm. portrait lenses sure. that have one-to-one -one scaling. You're mm -hmm. an events photographer photographer use only zooms, sure. ones that have long distance uh, capabilities. Of course, yeah. You know, that's just how you work. But in cinematography, you use all those lenses. A full set of lenses. <laughs> and that, so that, that and accuracy of the yes. T-step has to be dead on. So this is T is transmitted light, right? So transmitted it's light, So a measured yes. light coming through. So we're guaranteeing yes. that. So if you use a light meter, right. a good light meter, sure. and you, you measure an f-stop on right. that light meter, yeah. it should correlate to T-stop on the lens, right. because the T-stop will take into account any slowing down of the light that's due to coatings. Sure. Yeah. So it's and actually so then it's actually more accurate. Accurate. Mm -hmm. So see, so this will always have that scale that's you know <laughs> calibrated. No, exactly. Yeah. 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 That's another difference. So what about the mechanics of the iris themselves? I know there's multiple ah, bla the blade, good. the blades, things like that. That's a big difference. Usually a big difference. That's a very nice uh, thing to bring up because you can see that you would usually have a rounder blade mm -hmm. shape mm -hmm. when you're using a cinema lens. You will notice that cinema lenses tend to have more. Uh, leaves. More blades in, more the, more blades. Leaves. Yeah, in yeah. the actual iris itself. In the actual iris itself. Mm -hmm. And then it's also a, due to the size, the way that the shape and the, the way they're created, mm -hmm. uh, it's meant to give you a soft bokeh, the, mm -hmm. the yeah, autofocus the background. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it looks good when in motion. And mm -hmm. still, sometimes it's, you, you know, you, you might find 
a more, you know, squared off a rectangular, rectangular or, or, or maybe like, ed, yeah. you know, one with edges. It might yeah. look more interesting. Yeah. But in motion, it tends to be that people prefer to have the more soft rounder. Mm -hmm. So then that, again, is a control mm -hmm. through the iris. Yeah. And that's one yeah. of the big differences here. So mechanically, we're more precise clockwork as it is. Right. We have gearing, we yes. have consistency, uh, we have long throws. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I noticed just looking at the two lenses here and in general, they're all about the same shape and size, your cinema, your CP2 lenses right. anyway, it, right? And this is a good comparison because yeah. it's a 135 yeah. and this is a 50. And you can notice that the focus gear and the right. iris gear are still in the same position. They all line up, right. And then there's only a few of the lengths that actually have this size. You right, can, usually they're see, all exactly Usually the they're all the same exact size as this. But, but they're all, and these all these lenses are all the same front diameter. So you can 114. Use 114. So you can use the same map yes. boxes, et cetera. So it's and consistency as well. I guess. And consistency is very important on set because you want to move quickly. You want to yeah. take that map box Box off, you want to change the lens, and you want to put that matte box back on. So the mechanics are really built for cinema. I mean, it's, built for cinema. it's built for cinema application. And uh, you could talk about, you know, how hardy is it? Yeah, strong, it can hold sturdy. up a matte box. You right. know, you could put a clip on matte box with mm -hmm. three filters in it, sure. and it'll hold together. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but the housing itself is made to be durable and last a long time. Sure, you could be on a three, thirty-day, sixty-day film shoot, mm -hmm. and you won't have any problems with something happening to the housing of the lens. So it makes that makes a lot of sense. The mechanics of it, mm -hmm. it's it's sturdy, it's strong. The other thing that I notice on cinema lenses is the markings, right? Yes. So, and so there's something about accuracy going on here, right? They have so, to be accurate yeah. because, you know, n especially today yeah. when you're using an electronic follow focus system mm -hmm. with a distance measure, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. Now, if your forefoot of your lens does not fall at four feet in not reality, focusing accurately when you're four. focusing accurately, yeah. but your distance measure is telling you should be at four foot. Your hand unit that's yeah. reading the distance measure mm -hmm. is telling you should be at four feet. Yeah. And you go to four feet and you're buzzing the shot, that's not going to work. Yeah, you know, I mean, you we have can't, to We have can't it. always pull by eye. I mean, no. today I know we have modern monitors. You can pull by eye, but that accuracy is still extremely important. So how do we make sure that those, line, those little lines, the lines here, and how they actually line up, how do we make sure they line up? What makes this lens, our cinematic lenses in general, different that way, making sure those marks actually mean something? How do we do that? Well, know? all professional cinema lenses allow you to do something very important, which mm -hmm. is to shim the lens. Okay. Because what you want to do is you want to be able to take this one camera system that you're using, mm -hmm. along with the whole set of lenses, mm -hmm. and you might have 11, 15, 20 lenses mm -hmm. that at some point you might use on this camera during that project. You want to balance all your lenses so they're shimmed correctly. That as soon as you put it on the camera using this, you know, focal plane, right there, yeah. you're going to have the exact correct focus marks. So that so when we shim it, we're actually changing slightly the mount mm -hmm. so that we have extreme accuracy between the mount position and the sensor. So we know we're basically dead on and focus at the right points. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. In fact, we can show you how to do that. Let's do it. So let's, well, let's first, let's see how far off we are if we're off at all. Can we do that? Exactly. Yeah, let's do and that. And then we could shim it. And, and shim what it. we're going to do, actually, is we're going to open up one of these interchangeable mount sets yeah. that we have for the CP2. So, so just as a side note, interchangeability is one of the best things about CP2s, right? Yeah. That's the best thing about the compact primes and, and the compact and zooms, zooms, is that any of these, you can actually change the mount right. to a number of different other systems. Right. We can do, of course, PL mount, which is for film cameras, mm -hmm. but you can do EF mount for Canon, which is becoming very popular. Yeah, it's across you know. the range. We see it on all kind of cameras, from mm -hmm. Blackmagic to RED, right? I mean, exactly. It's, yeah, it's very popular. It's very popular, and then we could also do E mount for Sony, <laughs> of course, yeah. which is really nice because that's becoming a popular system as well. Mm -hmm. You can still do Micro Four Thirds, which mm -hmm. not many people do, yeah. or you could do Nikon mount. Sure. And so then you have a lot of different choices on what kind of mounting system, you know, what kind of cameras these lenses can work on. So that makes this these more versatile overall. That's exactly. one of the great things about these lens sets. So in the this is the set to change out the, the mount, but also right. shims are included in here to make sure that this is accurate still, right? So this is the system for the 50, and this yeah. is to uh, change it to EF mount. I see. And just like you said, we actually include a set of shims ah. inside over here. So we're going to talk about how we're going to shim this, you mm -hmm. know, is yeah. going to be we're going to measure it first, like you said. Yeah. And if it's off, we're going to take a look at what shims are already in there, mm -hmm. calculate what difference we need, and then change it. Because mm -hmm. each shim, you know, each color shim actually has its own value. Yeah. And awesome. we have a chart that you can actually download from online, mm -hmm. and it'll tell you what each value does and what you might have to change. So let's let's uh, so let's do it. Let's 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 show let's show how it's done. And I, we do this here a lot at AA with different tools, but you yes. can actually do it yourself, right? So let's just so let's go, put this lens on and, and why don't you uh, grab measuring the measuring tape, tape and, we'll, and we'll see how it does. Let's yeah. go to it. Yeah. How are we going to do this? <laughs>
Well, first we have to change the lens. Let's put this 50 on. Okay. And then set it five feet away from the focus chart. All right, great. All right. So we have the 50 mil on now. Mm -hmm. And according to this chart that we have, okay. uh, which is downloadable from the Zeiss website, and I think we can link it here on the blog as well. Yes. This will basically take you through shimming a lens, right? And it says right here that at 50 millimeters, if I'm using that length, I should set the focus chart at five feet away and open up the lens all the way. So this is, goes up to a T1.5. Okay. We're gonna open up all the way in the iris. Great. And let's check the distance right now. So, so this chart, the chart that you're, we're gonna provide tells you all this information that you need to know, right? It absolutely tells you and it also tells you how much you're uh, off by when it comes to the shims. Oh, wow, So that's we're great. gonna show you that too. So that's how they can actually do the shimming. Oh, that's exactly. Fantastic. Okay, so I wanna put it right there as the mark. Okay, so I'm at four foot and nine inches. Okay. And so we're gonna move it a few inches back so okay. that we're at five feet. So okay. do you notice that I'm actually moving the chart? Mm -hmm. So you wanna move the chart or the camera. You don't wanna move, you don't wanna refocus. Okay. You wanna keep it at five feet, okay? Okay. So I'm rolling on this now, too, yeah. so we can see that. So it's pretty sharp there. There, well, This is five feet right here. Oh, OK. So did it get softer? It as a little I, softer when you moved back. Ah. You were just at, a little further past that. And, and so we were on when we were not exactly at five feet. So at five feet, we're not getting tack sharp focus. Not as sharp as it was before. So what we can do now is we can move the, the chart forward an inch. So we're at five foot or four foot uh, 11 inches. Yeah, not as good. Yeah. OK, not yeah. as good. And we go back to five feet, and then five foot one inch. So five foot one inch is the place. It's dead it, sharp. It's there. dead sharp at mm -hmm. five foot one inch. Yeah. Okay. So that means we're off by one inch. Let's go Correct. look at our chart. Yeah. And what does our chart say? Well, here you go. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Andy. So looking at our chart, we can say, all right, when we're looking at a fifty mil lens, and we're off by one inch. So we're actually at five foot one inch. Mm -hmm. It says that we need to add point zero three worth of shims. So it's like 0 0.03 micron shim or something? Exactly. Wow. So if we go back to here, a 0 0.03 means me had to add a light blue shim. So, wow. so it color codes it for you, tells you what to add. Color codes it for you. Great. This is a, a set, this is a uh, interchangeable mount system set okay. for an EF mount for this lens. Oh, great. Now luckily inside this uh, set uh, already is a set of shims. Nice. Okay. okay. So the next step that we have to do is we have to take off the lens okay. and let's take a look at what shims are already on there. Great. And as you can see, I'm using a Torx screwdriver, and I'm going to take out these eight little screws. The nice thing is I'm not really touching the rear element mm -hmm. uh, of the lens. You know, there's, there's no glass being affected by this change of the mount. It's just the metal mount itself. Mm. And this is the same procedure you would use for changing the mount as well. That's great. And All right, oh, so we, we took it off. And yeah. there we can see that it has a what looks to be a white shim in here. I so you see. can yeah, you can a. see that I can shift it and move it just a little bit. You can see. see. Yeah. You see that? Yeah. So there's a white shim in there. All right. Okay. So let's what's, look at our chart. Right? Yeah. And our chart says that a white shim is 0 0.06 uh, nanometers. And we need to add 0 0.03 more. So right. it's 0.09-ish, right? Now if, let's take a look at the shims that we have. And I'm using the EF mount kit. So when I open up the interchangeable mount system, the shim is actually one of the components in there. I see. You could also get this separately, a okay. shim set. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's very easy to order. In fact, the chart that I'm looking at will so give you the part numbers oh, for wow. all these. That's great. Um, this has the EF mount back and screws, and of course the EF mount itself as well, just so you can see what that looks like. Yeah. So if I was changing the mount, you notice that PL mount has a different flange focal distance, you know, once you put it on the mount. Of course. Then an EF mount, so EF mount's much more shallow. Oh, I see, there's, there's extra yeah. piece here. So you oh. have an extra piece, and of course it comes with a support system as well. Because the EF mount's not that sturdy, so we had a little extra yes. beefiness to it. That's exactly, good. and you can see that on the, the 134 right, right here. There. It's already okay, on there. So you can use a, a traditional lens support with that, that's great. Exactly, and mm -hmm. that's what you want to be able to do because, yeah. as you said, the mount's not the greatest. Yeah. And these all line up with the registration pin mm -hmm. that's already on the lens itself. So you can actually just line the system up, put it on, you're good to go. In this case, we're going to keep the PL mount, so let's put this aside. And we'll take a look and we'll see that on our chart, uh, a 0 .03 is actually a light blue is wow. the Point shim that shim. you want to is. And in, in this case, since there is a 0 .09 value. You just know, like, if, nice to have, no, if there was 0 .09, we just add that one shim and be done, but there's not, so. Correct, we would take out to. the white in that case and then add just that one. Got it. Because you want the least shims possible. Right. In this case, two shims is not bad. Right. Uh, so we're going to go take this light blue one 
And let's put that in here carefully. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see you line it up, and there's an extra slot there for the registration oh, pin. So it just pops right on top mm -hmm. of there. Pops right on top of there, and look at that. It lines up yeah. just fine. And now I can just put my mount uh, back, back on. on. Yeah. And this, of course, again, lines up with the registration pin. So you just turn it around until you see that registration right there. Easy. And boom, put yeah. it back on. And of course, I've set my Torque uh, Vario S screwdriver here from Weha to 0.26. Newtons per meter because it's a good torque setting. Yes, yeah. that's a good torque setting. This basically won't let me over tighten the <laughs> screws, so I'm not going to ruin oh, anything. I'm right. So the screwdriver oh. is literally preventing you from overdoing it. The clicking noise is it reaching its limit, basically. Exactly. Nice. Yeah. Super easy. We actually sell the screwdriver system as well oh. with the correct size uh, torque screw um, for the the lens mount change. That's great. Yeah. So easy as that. Put it back together again. Quite simple. Yeah, quite simple. And then in theory, when we're done... We should like, be in focus. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah the, the, the really nice thing about being so easy to do and being this safe to do in the sense that you're not really touching it in the optics right. is that owner operators can do this. Right. Because Something if we do here in house with, with you know fancier tools than just a, a lens chart, but yes. you can do it just with this. And obviously, exactly. that wasn't so hard. No, and because you know you want to have it balanced for your camera system because you want to be able to put any lens you want mm -hmm. during the shoot, and they all should focus correctly. Yeah, absolutely. Especially with the wireless systems nowadays, right? Yeah. All right. So let's put this one back on, on. Got it. and mm -hmm. then I'm going to go ahead and grab this and go back out. Okay. There we You're go. All set. And make sure the focus is set to five feet. Going to five and the iris feet. is open all the way. All the way. Exactly. So you get the shallowest depth of field possible. Feet. Mm -hmm. Let's back. measure that and let's see if we're at five feet. Go right there for me. And what does it say? I'm off just a little bit. Let me just shift this right back, back to go. five feet. Boom. Oh, beauty, yeah. How's the focus look? Really good. Really yeah. sharp? Mm -hmm. And what you can do to test it is go out of focus and then back to five again, there and you'll right. see a, a difference on your monitor. There you go. There you go. And if it's focusing correct at five feet, mm -hmm. Then we've done a good job. All right. Nice good work. Job. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, shimmability. This is a big deal with the lens. The Look, lens. you can't have a cinema lens without yeah. the ability to shim. Right. Because you, then you can't go from system to system mm -hmm. and, and work equally as well right. on a lens C300 one. one day, yeah. uh, an Epic the next day, and an Alexa Mini the third. That's great. You know? So, this is a big deal. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and, th and this is a key attribute of cinema lenses. Now we kind of have an idea of this is what the cinema lens sort of means in many ways. Right. But there's also some unique characteristics about these lenses. We learned some of them already, interchangeable yes. mounts and the same front diameters, things like that. But the look and feel of these lenses is pretty unique, especially in the new super speeds and the, and the new zoom lenses. I want to talk about that a little bit. What, what, what makes these lenses a little bit more unique even in the cinema world? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, let's look at the super speed lenses because you yeah. already have it on the they red the 50, camera. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you have yeah. the 50, and this is actually a super speed version. Right, yeah. So out of all the CP2 lines, and there's a number of CP2 lenses yeah. ranging from 15 millimeters mm -hmm. all the way to 135. Right, yeah. Right? Yeah. And everything in between, including a 50 macro. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the three it's most. Big set. Yeah. It's a big set. Yeah, and yeah. The, the three most popular lengths is the 35, 50, and 85. Ah, okay. okay. And what we've done is we have a new version of these, the super speeds. Mm. Now let's examine what this actually does. Yeah. So at a T4, yeah. any of our lenses and most lens, cinema lenses in the world, yeah. at a T4 they perform really well. Yeah, absolutely. That's it, the sweet sort of sweet spot for the lens. It's the sweet spot for the lens. Speaking, yeah. You have good light transmission, yeah. you have good sharpness, yeah. um, you have the you know less chromatic aberrations, less aberrations in general. Sure. Meaning, you know, decontrasting, there's mm -hmm. less of that. There's yeah. less chromatic aberrations. There's less of the flaws that you would, you know, normally see when you open up a lens. Sure. As soon as you open up a lens and it's really if it's really fast. Yeah. Uh, it will actually start displaying some of these aberrations. Wow. Yeah. And now you would think that we don't like aberrations. But these days, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. aberrations aren't so bad, right? We like that. We like the right. idea of them anyway, right? Well, something because uh, unique or something not so digital about the image, I guess you could say. Yeah. I think you made a really good point there yeah. because in the film plane, yeah. remember, yeah. the red, green, and blue substrates Definitely. were layered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that meant if there was a problem at the edge of, let's say, a high contrast, mm -hmm. it would be softened and kind of defocused and you wouldn't really see the kind of flaws right. you do on a flat digital sensor. Right, yeah. So on a flat digital sensor, if the red, green, and blue don't hit at the exact same mark, mm -hmm. you see a distinct difference mm -hmm. because of chromatic aberration, sure, you see yeah. a big 
big difference in the high contrast areas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, interesting, yeah. And of course, you try to mitigate some of that with a good low pass filter and things like that. Sure. But at the same time, you, you really can't if the lens is flawed. Yeah. But the problem is that we actually enjoy those flaws. We do. <laughs> <laughs> it's a look. It's a look. It's right. a look, yes, yeah, yeah. because of the, the decontrasting of highlights mm -hmm. and the softening of the edges sure. is what's reminiscent of film because sure. it kind of emulates what happened on the substrate level sure. of filmmaking. Yeah, yeah, so. so in nowadays, a lot of cinematographers are always looking for a way to, like you said, affect mm -hmm. the image. Right. How can you do that? One, filtration. Yeah, of course. Right? Yeah. Two, you do something to the lens. Yeah. <laughs> now, the, the, the beauty of doing something to the lens is that you're not losing light transmission. So right. with the filter you're losing, you're changing the quality of the light mm -hmm. a little bit, but yeah. you're also losing some light. Right. But wouldn't it be nice if a lens that was super fast can do that already? Right. Well, that's the reason why people are going back to the old super speed lenses. Yeah, the original, yeah, throwback, throwback lenses. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the because vintage, they yeah. Were, the coding was a little different, sure. the yeah. construction design and just the engineering slightly different. So it has a different kind of style and feel to it, right? It yeah. actually has chromatic aberrations. It's problems, basically. Yes. But, but it has flaws, flaws yeah. which actually are more magnified when you open up the lens all the way. Sure, yeah. So what we've done is we've taken that concept and brought it to the CP2. Right. Now this CP2 lens, the 50 for example, yeah. and the 35 mm -hmm. and the 85, mm -hmm. all three of these were really, really nice and sharp at a T2.1 and fantastic at a T4. Mm -hmm. And we knew that if we open up more than T2.1, they start falling apart. Mm -hmm. Well, these lenses, they allow you to do that. They yeah. allow you to open up up to a T1.5 and they actually fall apart. Mm -hmm. And we could see that when we change the lens, and let's say we defocus the lens and, and point at a highlight, like a light source, for sure. example. Yeah, let's look at that, yeah. Yeah, you're going to see a big difference right now if you move from a T2.1 to a 1.5. You're mm -hmm. going to see some decontrasting. Yeah. You're going to see the highlights, kind of the chromatic aberrations happening at the edges of yeah. the highlight, high contrast areas. Mm -hmm. And you're just going to see an overall softening and look and feel of a different type of lens. Hmm. And so that's what the Super Speed does. It actually is not uh, just a faster lens at T1.5. It actually is a specific look. look. Ah, so that's, that's the stuff that I think everyone's looking for today because again there's, there's there's a lot of great cameras out there yes. the lens becomes sort of artistic and uh, it becomes an artistic t choice i mean it's, yes. which i think is really interesting dynamic of today so and the super best speed part yeah. yeah and yeah. the best part about these super speed lenses is yeah. that they're sub $5000 each they come with a one year warranty yeah. if you fill out the registration and get a second year warranty for free. Mm. So basically right. a sub $5,000 lens that has a two year warranty that still gives you the choice, mm -hmm. let's say it reminds you of that choice, yeah. a T2.1, you don't have to worry about this. Right, yeah, yeah. It gives you the choice of having a super speed If lens. you want like that look. Yeah. If you want that look. That's great. And the, the kind of you know coatings that are used in these lenses are very high quality. Um, the nice thing about the CP2 line mm -hmm. is that it's full frame coverage. That's great, yeah. So let's talk about what that means. So that's that's another unique characteristic, right? So mm -hmm. we across the line, in the, C, the CZ2, CP2 line. Exactly. All but the 18 cover full frame, right? So, Absolutely. So this is a big deal, especially with the new cameras coming out today. Yes. Uh, we're talking about 8K VistaVision sensor from RED in the future. And of course, I can imagine other manufacturers making larger sensor cameras in the future as well. Yes. So. Today, the Zeiss lens covers. But what does that really mean? People say coverage, right? And yes. 8K, 6K. It's not about Ks. No. It's just about image circle, right? So let's, And it's let's, really yeah, easy to demonstrate on this camera, the yeah. Dragon, for example, because yeah. you had the various resolutions you could film yeah. at. Right, yeah. And actually, what it's doing is it's literally cropping the sensor. Right. So using less parts of it. Right. So let's look at this right now. Why sure. don't you go ahead and change the resolution on the camera to the lowest it can go, which is, I, th I believe, HD. Yeah, or 2K HD. 2K HD. And then you'll see how much of the chart you're going to see. So I'm going to move this chart a little bit closer. So I'm going to go ahead and roll on that. Yeah. And you're very, very full framed now. So yes. I'm going, to just, I'm going to stop down a little bit for the sake of this. Yeah. And I'm going to go ahead and roll on this. Now I'm right in the I'm right dead center, middle of the uh, uh, middle of my uh, sensor. So this is same. You moved it closer, but this is just you know I haven't moved the camera. Right. Uh, this is center cut of the sensor, right? So Correct. So we're obviously it, the lens covers here. Uh, and, let's, and most lenses will. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> because, uh, you know, this kind of image circle is very common. Right. So let's go a little bit bigger. So, so why don't you go that. to uh, 3K? Yeah, we'll 3K. HD for now. Mm -hmm. And we're well, getting a little bigger. Okay, I roll on that. So now we got more of that circle in there. So you're yeah. seeing that you need a now a lens that would be able to cover right. this. Right. Okay. So this is a bigger area of that sensor, right? Mm -hmm. So this is, a, but this again, this image circle of this lens covers it very well. Right. Okay. Yeah. 
And we have a chart that you can look at, yeah. and it'll show you oh, that chart. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. like approximate image circle sizes yeah. of the most common format. So let's yeah. change it to 4K. Now, 4K in the Dragon uh, Epic sensor is actually very similar, uh, I would say, and I hope you agree, to Super 35. Yeah. So this is it's pretty much right on, and and obviously again cover very well. Here it is. Again, we see more. We see more of the picture. We see more of the picture. <laughs> yeah. Okay. More of the, of the chart in this case. But yes. yes. See, it's, again, we didn't move the camera. Didn't move the, the chart. So it's just more. <laughs> exactly. So right. you're just seeing more, and yeah. that means the lens would have to cover that size sensor. Right. So let's talk about what cameras are Super 35. You're talking about your Alexas, yeah. your Blackmagic cameras, Cannons. your Canon 7D, which is APS-C size, right. approximately the size of Super 35. Airy cameras and Airy most cameras. modes. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Film yeah. cameras Film in general cam yeah. are about this size. Right. So this lens would be fine for any of these camera systems going back 100 years. Absolutely. But now let's go to 6K. Now 6K, you can see that on our chart, is now outside the Super 35 uh, millimeter way. image circle. All the way to 6K. All okay. the way to 6K. Now you will find that certain lenses will not cover this image circle. Again, no, we're covering 100%, and you can know you're covering. You see, I see the full chart now. Exactly. We know, we, we know we're covering because we don't see any. And you're actually there's a little in the shot there now because before I'm a little you, in the shot. Yeah, but now I don't see any darkening of the edges, right? So I you see no vignetting. No vignetting, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's not. We haven't. The circle is well over this still. Right. Exactly. Yeah. In fact, this circle is so large that I can actually get the 8K sensor and yeah, put Vista this Vision. lens on it, yeah. which is the 8K full frame, they still call it. Yeah, it's yeah. a VistaVision size sensor. Yeah. And that uh, lens will actually cover that sensor as well. Yeah. So the benefit of the CP2 line and the along with the compact zoom line right, yeah. is that you're going to have full coverage. So let's go ahead and switch this lens back to the 28 to 80, which yep. is sitting right over there. Mm -hmm. And let's make sure that this coverage is actually accurate. So leave it, I'll leave it in 6K? Yes, you can leave it in 6K. So we haven't changed anything in the camera. Let's just make sure our zoom lenses can cover it. Okay, I'm going to roll again. I'm going to zoom all the way out. Just yeah, for zoom the, all the way out. I'm going to sure. go. To, I'll go to. Well, I'll go to. We're, go to about approximately 50. Because we were at. Because we, we were at 50. 50 so just yeah. to show that we have the same and open mm -hmm. up. I'm going to open up a little bit again. Yep. And get in focus because I like things to be in focus. Okay. <laughs> and I'll roll. And we, we take a roll look again at so you can see that. Yeah. So same image, right? No here. vignetting at the edges. No vignetting. It Except completely covers. Obviously, again, they can see that you're, you're in the shot again. It's wide. Here's, give, me, give me a corner. <laughs> there you go. Look, now we got to clean. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And the nice thing is you can use this uh, zoom lens on the AK sensor as well. Yes. Now, you're going to get an AK full format. You're going to get a little bit of vignetting with this zoom lens mm -hmm. on the edges, depending on the length of the lens. Sure, of course. Yeah. But it's acceptable in the sense that if you drop the resolution slightly to like 8K HD or something like sure. that, yeah. you're going to be perfectly fine. Yeah. So it, it, and what that really tells you is... That's better than almost every zoom lens out there on the market. There really isn't any, very few lenses, period, that do this in the cinema space. Exactly. Uh, almost none. <laughs> so <laughs> you have that going, for yes. sure. On so, the prime lenses, there's yeah. definitely some competitors sure. that do create right. full format so prime lenses. But in the zoom space, yeah. you know, cinema zoom wise, there really isn't any choices. Right. So and just to, nice just thing. to show, just because I think it's worth showing, let's, well, I wanna, we're going to get some B-roll here. I'm going to show what a, what a lens that doesn't cover full frame what that looks like, and I'll go ahead and put it on there. Let's do that. Uh, yeah. Let's put it on right now. Let's yeah. take this lens off yeah. and then show them in the 6K mode what yeah. a lens that's supposed to cover Super 35 uh, would like, look like. Yeah. Wow, that's right. a big difference, and you see the image circle right there. See obviously. That, that fuzzy black line, it's the fuzzy line. That's the circle, limited. It's basically, there's no more image outside of that area. Right. So this lens is all it covers. That's fine. That's like Super 35 is most cameras, as we said, but to go beyond that, that's when we start talking about what this lens can do. Exactly. So we'll put this lens back on, the 28 to 80, and we'll see that, again, in 6K, we're fully covered, and we're all set. And I'm going to zoom through Rolling that. all the way to 28, to the widest, mm -hmm. and go all the way to 80. Yep. And you're well covered. Do you see any vignetting whatsoever? No, we're good. You're yeah. absolutely covered. And like I said, this could even handle a larger sensor as well, like mm -hmm. a VistaVision size sensor. No, that's great. Tell me more about these uh, compact zoom lenses. We know a lot about the CP2s, but I know these lenses, the, the, C, the, C, the compact zoom, they're pretty different than the compact primes. Can you tell us more about what makes them sort of different overall and, uh, and the qualities of them? 
Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the compact zooms were designed after the CP2s. So they're right. actually a lot newer. Mm -hmm. And as you've seen through the blog article that you did, yeah. was uh, that they actually, when you put them up against a higher quality lens like the Ultra Prime, yeah. they seem to match well with those. Yeah, they hold their own for sure. They yeah. hold their own, yeah. yeah. So they're actually better than uh, the quality even the CP2s have right. yeah. in, in a number of different ways. Uh, first of all, they were, of course, designed uh, separately, brand new and ground up built for cinema applications. Mm -hmm. So it's a fully, you know, functioning cinema lens in a very lightweight housing. Compact. Really it's compact. That's a compact. That's point. where the name comes from. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Between five and a half to six pounds, so slightly larger than a Master Prime. Sure. But basically giving you all the zoom capabilities. They're T2.9 all the way through, so they don't actually ramp. Uh, they have good focus tracking, so mm -hmm. when you, you zoom through, you're staying on point. Yeah. Uh, they don't have any uh, a lot of breathing, mm -hmm. so that the shape and size of your frame is not changing as you focus. You look for in a zoom, yeah, yeah, all the good things that you would really want from a high quality lens, plus featuring our T-Star coating. So what's that? And the T-Star coating actually uh, developed in the beginning as a coating to, to, to basically cut reflections back. Okay. I mean, you can see this real easily right now by looking at this lens and we'll, we'll do a closer image for you. But basically, if you take a look at this lens right here, I'm going to reflect back the light that's on set and you could see that the light reflecting back at the camera is dim, first of all and it's only reflecting magenta and green colored light mm -hmm. back at you yeah. and at and very little amount. So that's right? the coating actually working there. Exactly, and if you compare that to, let's say, this cell phone, and you can see the glass on here is reflecting a oh, lot of light back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can actually see the color of the light too, which is quite white. Yeah. So that's the big difference over here is that the T-Star coating mm -hmm. is absorbing and not reflecting back mm -hmm. all the visible light that's coming out. Oh. What that actually does is that gives you a nice high contrast image. Oh. Hmm. Right, and ah. it actually cleans that's it up that, for you. That's part of that nice contrast overall that people know mm -hmm. and love. And, and the look. Of, yeah, the look of it, yeah. Wow. <clears throat> and then the way that the coatings are applied to all the different elements, as you can see, inside the lens, yeah. and the way it all works out, and the actual engineering design of this lens, uh, results in a superior cinema quality lens. Ah. So, I would say that we've covered pretty well the difference between a regular lens, a still lens and a, and a cinema lens here. Both mechanically, that clockwork, that working internally, the gearing, the pull. Uh, and, the, and the shimming, how that works and why that's so important. And then also, thank you for you know, letting us know all about the things that make these lenses different. I think there's just a lot of things going on here, but uh, Zeiss has definitely taken all that history and, uh, and, and, and put it into uh, these lenses. So it's great to see it keep evolving and, and, and evolving into more lenses over time. So yeah. um, thanks so much for coming by. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Andy. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Take care, everybody. Yeah.